You're gonna be just fine. I just talk. You know, I just talk. Listen to them. Children of the night. Sick transit. Gloria. Thrill me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kill the Cast. My name is Jerry, and joining me as always is the ever quotable Jay. Well, this is a top five episode, so I don't know what to do with that. That's completely fair. And filling in for Kenneth, who could not be here, is the wonderful Mr. Venom. Greetings and salutations, list lovers. And Jerry, you're always number one on my list, brother. I Damn, should that's be. That's a smooth fucking line. <laughs> that's that's why Jerry. That's why Mr. Venom gets laid. This is exactly why. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. We've been gone for quite a while, but we are back. We will be back to regular recordings. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, for anyone who did not catch my live video. Um, one of the biggest reasons we have been gone is I've been having extreme vision problems and I can't see shit and I can't read shit. And, um, basically I have something called, uh, diabetic retinopathy and it's the second to worst, uh, stage of it. And soon I will be getting needles shoved in my eye once a month, uh, to get injections to hopefully improve that. And I'm also now in a, in a place where I can record a lot easier and more often. So, we're back. Welcome back to us. Two trailer park girls go around the outside. You know what I'm saying? should definitely have someone record your eyes getting stuck with needles. And uh, we should upload them to the Kill the Cast Facebook. Unfortunately, we cannot because I am in a clinical, uh, clinical study. So, uh, that yeah, will and not and all that. be allowed. Um... So the only person who knows what I'm getting stuck with is the 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 doctor who's sticking me with him. I don't actually know. So is this like an experimental treatment or something? Um. So it's to uh. Tr so basically, people with diabetic retinopathy, normally the medicine they take they have to do it once a month, but this new drug is, that they're trying out is once every four months. So, I'll be doing this study for two years, and I'll either get the four, the once every four month drug or the once every month drug, and I won't know which one because they'll numb my eyeball, so I won't know if I get stuck or not, mm. um, but I'll either be getting stuck once a month or once every four months. Gotcha. But it's a double blind study, so I, I won't get to know, and obviously we can't film it in case they're... Mm shoving me with the fake one gotcha. gotcha oh good luck brother yeah hopefully i don't go fucking blind but like at this point like i i i, I can't i have to get like fucking an inch away from anything to be able to read it and even then sometimes i can't read it hmm. so it sucks dick i'm not trying to go blind but the important part here is that jay what have you been up to <laughs> um, not losing my vision. I can't believe you didn't even tell me that. Uh, I tried to watch you live, but you always do them while I'm at work, and I can't. I have to always use my phone, so I, it doesn't minimize. So I like to watch the first few seconds. It's like, oh shit, I got to use my phone. Uh, so that's that's that. I'm I'm pretty normal. Um, I'm have a, a good job prospect at uh, Kayla's place of employment. Um, that if that goes through, I'll be out of retail for good and fully finally uh so i'm excited for that but jesus dude yeah it's it's been i've only found out about this over the past month and uh it's it, it's a lot to type and typing isn't as easy as it used to be for me so that makes sense yeah but uh venom what have you been up to Oh man, just lots of work and um, not really. I mean, California is still pretty bad, especially Southern California with the whole pandemic thing. So I, I haven't really been as outdoorsy as I would as I normally would like. 
So I haven't really been able to frequent the casinos that I usually go to and things like that. Um, honestly, it's really just been the summer series on uh, the podcast under the stairs has taken up the majority of my last three to four months of my movie watching life. And um, now that I'm free from that, I'm kind of just back into kind of the, the standard groove of, you know, fresh cuts every week, no more room in hell every few weeks and just, you know. I was trying to stay busy as much as I can, but yeah, just not a whole lot to do with this pandemic, you know? Yeah, I am really upset that I had to drop from the summer series. I love the summer series. I've done it the past two years, but with everything going on health-wise, I just could not take that on my plate because I don't think people understand how much work the summer series is. It is a lot of work. (laughs) And I just couldn't do it. No, I don't blame you. Uh, it is it is a lot of work. I mean, you're watching, you know, 30 or so movies, sometimes more than once, especially once you got to narrow them down. And then at the end of the series, when you get to the round table, that's even more movies that you have to watch for the other years that you were not a host on. So, yeah, it, it's a big undertaking and a big commitment. So, yeah, it's definitely not anything to take lightly. So I can definitely understand you stepping down, you know, with everything going on in your life. So, It'll make the integrity of the show a lot better, which I did actually finish listening to the first show that you were supposed to be on. And they actually did a pretty good job. Yeah, they missed me. I know they did. But <laughs> it'll be OK. I'll be back next year. I I hopefully will be good by next year and we'll be back in there and hopefully we'll get some good big shows going on over here. And the next show I'm I'm scheduling and recording for myself um, should be underwater kaiju from outer space. Nice. Uh, woo. So we'll be we'll be back in some Godzilla land here shortly, also. But okay. With that being said, we decided for our first show coming back that we just wanted to do something kind of easy and fun. And who doesn't love list shows? And who also doesn't love recommendations of movies? That's how you find new stuff sometimes. You know, when you see all these movies on all these streaming services and you're like, well, what the fuck do I watch? There's so many options. Well, we each brought five movies apiece from streaming services that we think you need to check out and we're going to tell you why. And so we are going to start that off. And I guess I'm going to go first because why not? Sure. Um, Why not? So, one thing about my list is all five of my choices are from Shudder. Since Shudder is the cheapest and it is all horror all the time, I decided that I was going to take all five of my picks specifically from Shudder. So, nice. if you don't have Shudder, you can try one month and, and get it. Watch all five movies. <laughs> and watch all five movies. Um, so... I wanted to kick it off with with something easy for everyone, and that is an 80s horror. 80s horror is the probably the generically easiest decade of horror to get into. There's so many options. And this movie is kind of a slasher, kind of a mystery. It definitely is kind of riding on that. And it stars Linda Blair oh. from 1981, and it's called... Hell Night. Four college pledges are forced to spend the night in a deserted old mansion where they are stalked by the monstrous survivor of a family massacre years early. Uh, Kind of a basic setup, but most of the characters are are really enjoyable. Your two main characters, you know, are kind of the classic, like, will they, won't they, in this situation, come together. Um, and it's just a really fun movie to watch. I really like the killer. Um, I really like the mystery of everything. And it's set in this old mansion. So it even has that kind of classic 1930s, 1940s old dark house feel to it. It does really well with atmosphere while updating it involving, you know, these college students. Which, you know, was the thing of the 80s. It's always fucking college students. <laughs> so... I decided to go with Hell Knight. It's definitely one that I easily recommend. With that being said, 
Uh, have either one of y'all seen Hell Knight? I have not. I've seen Demon Knight. <laughs> I actually I actually own the Scream Factory special edition. I, I adore this movie. I absolutely love it. Saw it twice in theaters the week it came out. Um, I was a huge Linda Blair fan. I forgave her for The Exorcist 2, The Heretic, and continued to go and see her films. But yeah, I was very happy with this one. Um, you definitely don't see that swerve coming. And when it comes, it, it's actually pretty effective. Very satisfying ending. You know, decent gore for the time. It could have been a little gorier, but um, Jerry's right with the atmosphere. That gothic mansion is just gorgeous. It's a beautiful setting. Yeah, I fully agree with Jerry. Great movie. All right. Probably so, add it to my list for October then. Yeah. Two recommendations and a one never seen. That's a pretty that's a pretty good score for that one. With that being said, Jay, what is your next your number five? My number five, and just so everyone knows, these are in no particular order. Um, it's just I thought of them. I searched them if they're on streaming. If they were, I added them to the list. So uh, number five is No One Lives. And the good news for this is it's streaming on Tubi. Tubi. I can never say that one right. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a free streaming service. So anybody out there who wants to watch this movie, you, ha you have at it. It doesn't cost nothing. Um, no One Lives is a slasher movie. I um, There's a twist to it. And if you watch anything about this movie a trailer or a preview or anything the twist gets ruined immediately but if you go in blind and watch it it's pretty effective and i think really neat um i'd say the positives are um the gore it's 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 a slasher through and through i mean the plot is is very minimal and it's uh luke evans is the main guy and he just goes around killing people he's also naked at one point so any of you who like attractive men bonus um but yeah, I, I really, I just find it to be an incredibly entertaining movie. Um, it's newer, it's from the 2000s, uh, so it's not from the 80s or anything. But the the gore and the kills and just everything about it is fantastic. And like I said, I'm trying to be as vague as possible because if, if you guys have never heard of it and it piques your interest, then I would really recommend going in blind. Okay, well, I've never seen it, so I'm going to have to check it out, especially Naked Luke Evans. Uh, Venom, have you seen it? <laughs> I have seen it, yes. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I pretty much agree with Jay. This is uh, definitely a surprise of a film, you know, on on first watch, or not first watch, but if you watch trailers, you know, it kind of comes off as a very action-oriented film, but there's definitely a lot more to it once you get in there. And yeah, uh, I 100% agree with Jay. Some great, great kills. Nice and juicy. All right, so that's two recommendations and a one haven't seen. So that's definitely, definitely gets a thumbs up here. Uh, Venom, what is your number five? All right, so for mine, uh, for my list, uh, before I get into my list, I, I wanted to bring in as much different stuff as possible. So you're not going to be hearing any American films on my list. I'm bringing in five different movies from five different streaming services based out of five different countries. So I wanted to give everybody a variety. That's um, awesome. <laughs> yeah, some of the stuff is a little bit more popular. It may, it may not be necessarily hidden horror by any stretch, but I did pull out a couple of gems too. So I'm going to start right now with probably the new, well, definitely the newest movie on my film, on, on my film list, excuse me. Um, this movie, if you're in North America, this movie does count as a 2021 release, but it came out last year in the UK. It is a film that was supposed to hit American theaters in 2020, but of course, with the pandemic, everything got pushed back. And then once um, this film came out in the UK and made such a splash, they made a, you know, a big push to get it on VOD as quickly as possible. So we never actually got our theatrical release out here. And also, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that this movie is currently my number one movie of 2021. Anyone who oh, knows shit. anyone who knows anything about me knows I am a fan of slow burn character studies. This film is very divisive. You're either going to love this film or you're going to think it's the most boring thing you've ever sat through. But for me, it hits it, it checks off all the boxes for what I look for in psychological horror and character studies. And a lot of people will even make the argument that this movie isn't even a horror film until the last five minutes. But when those last five minutes occurs, it's absolute balls to the walls insanity. And for that, 
the first movie I am bringing to the list is from the UK, and that is Saint Maud from A24. Yes, I am an A24 lover, you know, whether, whether you want to call it elevated horror, or prestige horror, or whatever the hell you want to call it. I just call it a damn good time. And for the most part, A24 has really spoken to me. Their most recent film, The Green Knight, is probably the film that I would be the lowest on ever, though it is still a spectacular film. But um, long story short, I read The Green Knight multiple times um, in years past, and I love that story. And they made a lot of changes to the film that I don't really agree with. So there's my short review. Great movie. <laughs> that still could have been better. Anyway, back to St. Maud. This film is an absolute character study. We're following Maud throughout the entire film. She is a born-again Christian who used to be a drug addict and, you know, kind of promiscuous girl who's now obviously trying to make amends. She is the nurse, uh, the live-in nurse of a cancer patient, uh, a woman who used to be a dancer who now has stage four cancer and has very little time to live. Um, the movie kind of explores their relationship also with Maud being such a heavily religious person and the dancer cancer patient not being a religious person. It actually makes for some pretty cool, almost Tarantino-esque uh, conversations in the film. It is a very slow film. I can't overstate that, that it's incredibly slow and that all of the action literally is concentrated in the final five minutes of the film. But if you can make it to that five minutes, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. This is also a, um, a debut feature-length film for director and screenwriter Rose Glass. So another powerhouse female for the community, for those of you who are looking out for that. So yeah, um, again, this is a movie that I, I mean, this is a 10 out of 10 to me. I, I can't find any flaws with this film at all. Uh, we reviewed it earlier this year when it came out on Fresh Cuts. It has been my number one film of 2021 since it came out. I don't see anything dethroning that. Of course, it's only the halfway through August, so obviously I'm still open to something being better. But for something to impress me more than St. Maud, it's going to have to be like the godfather of horror films. So uh, that'll be my first film for the night. St. Maud, available on Paramount+. Plus. I also didn't want to bring. I'm glad that Jerry's doing all Shutter because I bring. I'm bringing no Shutter or Netflix to the table. I figure those are the two most popular streaming services for horror fans specifically. So I figure if you're a horror fan and you've got those services, you probably know already what you want to get into. So I'm going to bring in. Um, some different streaming services like Amazon Prime, Hulu, Tubi. But this particular movie, St. Maud, is available on Paramount Plus, which used to be known as CBS All Access. But um, it, the app isn't nearly as good as, say, like an HBO Max or something like that. But it's still it, it's it's really more for their television stuff. But there yeah, are some... every good Nickelodeon show on it. Exactly. I've been watching Kablam like crazy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, if, if you're a niche, you know, uh, watcher, a TV watcher, Paramount Plus, especially if you're into sci-fi, because they have all the Star Trek series, old and new. So I would imagine if you're a sci-fi, you know, TV watcher, you probably already have Paramount Plus. But, yeah, so that that is my uh, first feature for the night, St. Maud, technically from 2019. But if you're in North America, it counts as 2021. Okay, uh, Jay, have you seen St. Maud? I did. I actually watched it. Uh, I, I downloaded it at the tail end of 2020 is when I watched it. Um, A24 films are kind of all over the place for me. Um, I hated The Witch. I loved Hereditary and Midsummer, um, but those are more for the um, the parallels that my brain draws between the characters. Um, I did not like Saint Maud. Uh, I can. It's one of those movies that I can respect the the artistic technicalities of like the the shots are all really good looking and the cinematography is great the acting is fine it just didn't grip me story-wise um that final scene though man that's a that's a kicker i'll say that that's a that's a fantastic imagery right there but yeah it just it just wasn't for me uh green knight however is pretty top pretty top of the best of 2021 list for me uh, mm -hmm. as far as movies in general i fucking love the green knight 
I no, still... it was a great movie. I thought they put it together really, really well. It's just the changes that they made to the original story kind of changes the context. And the oh, for sure. I've story. never read it, so I had nothing nothing to yeah. go by. I just know I liked the main actor, and the trailer oh, yeah. gave me chills when I watched it. So I was like, oh, I gotta go see this. Yep. I have not seen The Green Knight. Um, for, I, I, it's going to be really hard for it to dethrone my top of 2021 all around non horror, which is currently Pig. Um, I don't. I, if I had to guess, I would say you would not like the Green Knight. At least not as much as me. Maybe I mean, sometimes you. I your your tastes are really hard for me to nail down. Sometimes uh, my wife yeah. is easy. I know her taste. If I see a trailer, I know instantly if she's gonna like the movie or not. Uh, your tastes are very hard for me to nail down. Um, so Green Knight could go either way. Uh, because other RC films I've suggested, you've been like, eh, that was stupid. Um, but who knows? Art films are so hit or miss for me, but they are like 70 75% miss. Um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. When it comes to St. Maud, I'm in the middle of y'all too. I think it's okay. Um, I do think there are enough horror, horror elements before the ending that like there there's an, enough couple of punches once you get past like mm-hmm. the initial setup that uh, I think it does a better job as a slow burn of keeping you engaged versus other slow burns that just do nothing and have that explosive ending looking at you house of the devil um you were trash <laughs> um but i I can't remember specifically what my problems were St. Maud was, but when I originally watched it, I had a lot of problems with the story. There were a lot of things I just didn't like, um, and you could kind of, and you kind of saw the ending coming, and you kind of knew what was happening, like, I, I, or at least I did, I knew what was coming with the ending. I had no doubt in my mind, uh, but they did do something clever enough with the ending that I did really like what they did with it. Um, but yeah, St. Maud is definitely one of those hit or miss films. Artistically, um, on a technical, like on a technical level, it is absolutely amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. But I mean, you expect that with all A twenty four films, they're very much a a on a technical level. This is going to be amazing. Um, their stories are usually just a little too artistic and very much about the metaphor that it doesn't mm-hmm. always hit if the metaphor is not strong enough. And I don't right. feel like the metaphor for Saint Maud is strong enough. I feel like it's just at this point in the world uh, that metaphor is just kind of old hat. But the characters are really fucking well done, so that kind of you know makes me go, well, damn, the the story is lacking to me, but those fucking characters are really well written. Mm-hmm. Um. So I guess on this one, we finally have a movie we've all three seen. We've got a huge thumbs up, we've got a middle ground, and we've got a thumbs down. So this one comes down to if you like art films or if you like the technical aspects of a film. Uh, If you think Citizen Kane is the greatest movie of all time, you already jack off to A24 films. Let's be honest. (laughs) I'm going to put it out there. And by the way, Citizen Kane is not the best film of all time. I understand that it pioneered a lot of technical aspects, but the story sucks. Okay? And this is coming from a guy who loves watching movies from the 1930s. So, yeah. fuck out of here. Get, if other we're, Orson Welles movies I'd actually prefer to Citizen Kane. <laughs> 100%. If we're going to give a, a movie time. from the 30s, that we're going to talk about being the best movie of all time. Give it to King Kong. If we're going to talk about technical aspects and technical breakthroughs. Give it to King Kong. Because almost every movie now is like 80% special effects. So let's give it to the movie that pioneered special effects. Mm-hmm. Suck it, fucking people who go to universities. 
Um, <laughs> that's. I actually did watch that in a film class, but we also watched Psycho and Silence of the Lambs too. So that was a fun film class. <laughs> that's fair. Okay, I'll give you that. All right. So next up on my Shutter recommendations, um, I also wanted to make sure I, I sparsed out my list. And um, I wanted to put a Giallo on here. But I want it to be a more easier digestible, but still maybe not as known when it comes to Giallo. I wasn't going to hit you with an Argento. So I decided, well, let's go with one that has a bit more slasher elements, but is still very much a giallo. So we're not doing pieces, but we are <laughs> doing Torso from 1973. Nice. A string of appalling lust murder shocks the University of Perguia? How the fuck do you say that? As a sadistic serial killer strangles the death of beautiful college girls, with a red and black scarf. This is uh, a little bit sleazier when it comes to giallos, but man, it is such a fun ride. It's got the same kind of mystery that you have with giallos is very much, giallos are basically slashers with more detective influence, more of a detective story. Um, most of them also focus a lot on how the movie looks versus how important the story is. So if you go into a giallo, understand the story is not a, not really that important. It doesn't really matter if it makes sense. It's more about the ride. It's more about the the sexual side of it, the horror side of it, the way it's lit, the the music, the shots. But this one's going to be a little bit easier for you to digest because. It's it's coming in with a lot of what would influence the slashers of the 80s. This is, you know, it's a masked person, a lot of people having sex get killed, that kind of thing. And it is it is it is done by Sergio Martino, which has done amazing films. So Torso should be on your list. There is a uh, amazing scene with a girl in a swamp and I just absolutely fucking love it. And the ending, the ending part of the movie that takes place in this house is just really claustrophobic while being so fucking tense that it really, it really kind of, you, you're sitting on edge. Like, is this, I don't know. This bitch is going to get it. I don't know if she's going to make it out of this. Um, so yeah, Torso. Now, Jay, I'm assuming you have not seen Torso. I have not. I'll add it to the list for October. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think you will enjoy it a lot. It, it would be a good... It sounds like something I dig. Stepping stone. Like, this and Pieces are kind of the two giallos that I would probably recommend to you the most because they're very, very slasherous. But I you'll watch this... I've seen Pieces. You might have, because I think Pieces is either very late 70s or early 80s. Um, but Torso, you'll watch it and go, wow, this is from 1973. This is, like, everything that is slasher. Um, nice. you'll So, I mean, slashers are, are they are born off of the back of Giallo's. And then, oh, of yeah. course, uh, Venom, I'm assuming you've seen <laughs> Torso. Oh yeah, this is another one I own. Yeah, I'm not the biggest Martino fan, but um, this period in his filmography, he was doing some really, really great stuff. Um, Case of the Scorpion's Tail is another great one. Oh, All the Colors yeah. of the Dark, especially Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. That that is I a great. Almost picked that one. Your Vice <laughs> was was what I originally had on the list, and then I changed it out because I was like. I want something a bit more easier to get someone into Giallos before they start moving into, like, the more heavy hitters that are, that you have to go in understanding that this is how a Giallo works. Yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, uh, uh, you made the right choice bringing uh, Torso to the table. It's definitely much more palatable for American audiences, I think. Um, and also, I did want to uh, point out Susie Kendall's performance at, in our lead role as Jane. Uh, just what a great performance by her. Yeah, Torso is definitely an underappreciated gem. You know, it's not it's not Argento or Fulci or any of the big, big names. So it, it may get buried. But yeah, Torso is a, is a must watch for most genre fans, I'd say. Yep. Okay, so once again, we've got two recommendations and one not seen. I like that. That's my fa- that's what I like. I'm two recommendations the not seen. Not this entire seen. fucking episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh well, I don't know. I feel like um I feel like Venom may hit me with some stuff I haven't seen. Um but we now move on to Jay. What is your fourth pick? All right. So I am suggesting the movie Triangle from 2009 uh this is on pretty much every streaming service uh to be let's see it's free to watch on youtube to be pluto tv peacock voodoo and amazon prime so any of those free to watch probably supported by ads um how do i describe this movie without giving away too much um so base the basic plot is a group of friends go out on a boat ride uh boat capsizes um, they find themselves next to an abandoned cruise ship. Um, they or they don't know it's abandoned. They will a cruise ship. They get on the cruise ship. They find out it's abandoned. Then a guy starts chasing them around and trying to kill them. And they're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, there are several twists to this movie. Um, so even if I were to give more details, there's still the the ending just kind of comes out of. Uh, um, it does a real good job of of keeping the ending to itself until the end, if that makes sense. I'm trying to figure out how to word that <laughs> where it makes sense. Um, but it's really good. Tense, uh, cat and mouse, mysteries and and revelations throughout the whole thing. Um, the effects are good. The acting is fine. Um, I just, it, it was recommended to me once when I was uh, doing, doing my October watches and I watched it and it kind of was like, damn. And ever since I've seen it, anytime... Anybody in a horror movie group says, hey, I need a recommendation for something I haven't seen. I recommend Triangle because it's just it has so much going for it. And it's so original in its execution that it's uh, it's it makes for a really good watch. Okay, well, I have not seen Triangle. So you're two for two for me. Um, And it does look interesting now that I'm looking at it. It does seem I may have to check this one out. I think you might dig it, but maybe it's. There, maybe I'd be very interested to see what you you say after you watch it. Gotcha, Venom. Have you seen Triangle? Yes, definitely. yes, I'm Venom. Um, I've seen every fucking movie. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I I really dig this one. This one also has some great kills. This one, this is a really good ex- um one of those like out of the frying pan into the fire type movies uh, where you know they get out of one bad situation just to get into a worse one yep. so you know that's a nice little swerve right there but yeah uh, they they definitely ramp up the horror in the third act you know after the uh, little change that i mentioned i don't want to get too much into it like jay said cuz uh, this is this uh, this really is a great movie to go in completely dark and I figure, you know, the movie's been out for, what, like 12 years now? So, I mean, if you haven't seen it by now, it's probably not on your radar. So, yeah, if you're hearing uh, about this for the first time here, yeah, I would recommend this one. Okay, dope. We've got two recommendations and one not seen, which is our current uh, perfect scoring for this episode. Uh, Let's see if uh, Venom's got another good one for us. Let's see. Uh, my next one, I think, is a good one, but I don't think it's going to be nearly as obscure as maybe we would have liked. Um, this is a, a Christmas film from 2010. Uh, this film comes from Finland. Now, if, if you're just like an American horror movie fan, you may not be familiar with this. But those of us, you know, hardcore horror fans are probably fairly familiar with this. It's available both on Shutter and on Hulu. I, I was highlighting Hulu for this one. And that is, of course, rare exports out of Finland. Now, like I said, amongst the community, I I think a lot of us have seen this. And for for even more of us, it's probably an annual watch at this point. This is absolutely a December watch for me. I I adore this film. I I have so much fun with this film every time I watch it. Um, Without giving away too terribly much about the film, it is based on a short film of of the same title from a couple of years earlier. And it is basically the telling of a, of a Santa Claus story, basically. And 
without giving exact details about the backstory, they give us a little bit of mythology on the Santa Claus legend, uh, both the good parts and the not so good parts. And, um, you know, this movie kind of goes into a almost like a manufacturing um, subtext or commentary, if you will, with um, kind of materialism. But in this case, uh, the materials are actually um, living. So um, it, it's really hard to get into without giving away key plot points. So I'm not going to do that. But yeah, this is, uh, like I said, out of Finland, 2010. If you haven't seen this one, I say m- m- pen pen this into your uh, calendar for December. I mean, you can watch it in August and it's just as fun. But if you haven't seen this, I strongly suggest it for December. Um, I assume at least one of you guys, if not both, has seen Rare Exports. Am I correct? Let's find out, Jay. I have not seen it. I am aware. I am aware of it. I just um, so I, I don't know. I've told Jerry this a couple times. Uh, while I have absolutely no problem with subtitles, um, a lot of the time I'm busy doing <laughs> something else, or I need to be busy doing something else to actually pay attention to the movie because of my ADHD, and it makes dedicating myself to just the movie harder so when it comes to subtitles it's really hard for me to find time to do only that one thing uh for however long um but uh like all the other suggestions you guys have had i'll probably add it to the list for october and and find some time to knock it out during my my october watches but i i've definitely been interested i just have not not had the time to watch it and to everyone's surprise i have not watched it um I'm not the biggest Christmas horror guy. Um, I, I, I'm not the big, like, the biggest, like, holiday horror guy. Um, it's definitely been on my radar. I've, I've seen tons of podcasts talk about it. And this year, I think I will try to actually sit down and watch it and, you know, maybe double feature it with Krampus, which I always watch during Christmas time. Um, I have no problem with subtitles. I actually feel like subtitles a lot of times make me pay a bit more attention to the movie because I can't pick up my phone and look up something because a lot of times I'll be like, where have I seen that actor? And I start going on fucking IMDb and then I'm looking at some made for TV movie he made when he was fucking 20 years old and this was the best thing he could do besides fucking getting (laughs) porn work. Um so I, I get in these weird rabbit holes, uh, which I try to be better about, but I'll be like, oh, wait, what does that mean? I need to look it up or, oh, where have I seen that person from? I need to see, um, which is why a lot of times I watch movies twice if I'm doing them for podcasting mm-hmm. once to just sit through and then a second time to kind of like, well, yeah. once I sit through while only taking notes and the second time I like trying to not take notes as much but just really focus on background stuff. So Mm -hmm. that's actually a really nice um, double feature you got there with Krampus um, because they're almost like two sides of the same coin. Whereas Krampus is jam packed with Christmas aesthetic. It's literally like Martha Stewart fucked a Hallmark store and the baby is Krampus. You know, there's just so much Christmas aesthetic in that movie. Whereas with rare exports, um, Yes, it's set during Christmas. Obviously, it is a Santa Claus story, but we're talking about a village in Iceland that literally has maybe a dozen people. And there's only, if I remember correctly, I think there's only two or three kids in the whole movie. So even though our main characters are kids, it's absolutely not a kid's horror film. But like I said, um, you know, you don't have to deal with like Christmas trees and Christmas decorations all over rare exports. Um, you know, so it's the kind of thing where if you like the Christmas aesthetic in your horror films, then yeah, go with Krampus or Black Christmas. If, if you're not the biggest fan of the Christmas aesthetic, um, then rare exports is a great way to go because you're getting that kind of classic mythology of the of the old Santa Claus story when he wasn't such a great guy. Uh, but then, you know, it's really more like The Shining in the sense that it, it's just a snowy village in Finland. Um, you know, the snow is going to be 90 percent of what you're looking at on the screen. So not a lot of like decorations and Christmas stuff getting jammed down your throat. So that's actually a nice double feature. What what did you call Krampus? Uh, Martha, like if Martha Stewart fucked a Hallmark store, that's how much Christmas aesthetic Krampus has. 
You know what? You're right. If you take out the gore and make it about Krampus cheating on the grandmother, it becomes a <laughs> lifetime movie. There you go. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's pretty valid. All right, one recommendation to not seen. Um, next up for me, my number three. I wanted a Japanese movie on this list. Man, what do you pick? Mm-hmm. There are 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 some fucking bangers on there you know you've got classics like audition and it's killer you've got lesser known but great exploitation movies with with like the 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 female prisoner scorpion movies but i decided that if there's one movie i was gonna put on there i was gonna go newer and i was gonna go something that innovates its genre Something that when I watched it, I named it my number one movie of this genre of all time. And that's One Cut of the Dead. Nice. Okay. Things go badly for a hack director and film crew shooting a low-budget zombie movie in an abandoned World War II Japanese facility when they are attacked by real zombies. This movie, I did a double feature. Okay, I watched um, Train to Busan, and then I watched One Cut of the Dead, and it was first time watches for me, and uh, Train to Busan, I was like, oh my god, this was this was so good, I don't really like zombie movies, but this was so fucking good. And then I was like, alright, One Cut of the Dead, this is probably, like, I've seen Japanese funny zombie movies like fucking Tokyo Zombie, this is probably not gonna be good, but... You know, it's Japanese, so I want to watch it. This movie not only was so fucking funny that I was dying laughing, but has so much fucking heart to it. It's so impressive on a technical aspect. And is just so fucking well written and just so well done that it charmed its way into my heart in ways that it shouldn't have. Horror comedies should never be, like, your number one of of a horror genre <laughs> like it's just it's just kind of like fucking like bad t- like if your favorite zombie movie Shaun of the dead i've got questions for you but god damn it one of the dead just fucking did it for me it is and oh my god that fucking ending <laughs> holy shit who i i cannot come over this movie enough i <laughs> feel like i'm i'm fucking uh fucking peter north just fucking ropes holy shit i i i love this movie it's one of it's definitely one of those movies that like i'm sorry if this is your first time hearing about this movie because you had to hear it from me and you didn't go into it like i did just going oh it's gonna be a, a goofy zombie movie because I wish I didn't even know that it was going to be a goofy zombie movie. I wish I would have known, like, nothing about this and had been even more awestruck by what I saw. Like, I don't think this movie gets the love and respect it does, and unfortunately that part of that's because of it coming around so close to Train to Busan coming out everywhere in America. This was not far behind it, but you have to watch the movie. Even if you don't like Japanese movies, even if you don't like zombie movies, you should watch this movie because it's just that damn good. It is so interesting. It is like nothing you've ever, ever seen. Um, with that being said, Jay, have you seen One Cut of the Dead? It's another one I am aware of, but I have not sat down to watch yet. That's fair. Unfortunately, it is subtitled. Um... Venom, I know you've seen one cut of the dead. Oh God, I uh, this is going to be the second reference to the podcast under the stairs for the episode. But yeah, uh, Duncan McLeish from uh, Podcast Under the Stairs actually recommended this movie for me uh, before it was available in North America. It's one of those titles that I had heard, and I'm like, oh, it's a zombie movie, so I'll definitely watch it. I don't anticipate a whole lot, but then. I was chatting with Duncan one day in a, in, in a Facebook chat and he talked about the movie because he had it in the UK before we got it here. 
based on his recommendation, I actually went ahead and bought a Region B Blu-ray of that uh, of uh, One Cut of the Dead. I do happen to have a multi-region Blu-ray player, so luckily I don't ha- always have to wait. And holy shit, I wholeheartedly um, double everything that Jerry said. This movie was such uh, just a shining light for me. It was so different. And it's one of those movies that you can't really tell people much about it. All you can really say is it's a zombie production gone wrong. Because if you give away too much of it, you're taking away just that spectacular feeling that maybe not everyone gets. But at the half hour point when we get the reveal of what's actually happening... I had an ear-to-ear grin on my face. I understand a lot of people don't consider this movie horror because of the reveal. I vehemently disagree. Um, The things that this film crew has to go through to make their zombie film is just... it's, It's funny, it's heartbreaking, it's terrifying, it's cringy. I mean, any adjective you could think of could fit this film. It's just so weird and wacky. And after watching this film for the first time, uh, for a good two week period, I couldn't get myself to stop saying "pum" just for no reason. Oh my I'd god! Just be yes. Around in a mall, and I would just put my hands together and go "pum." <laughs> and nobody knew what the hell I was talking about, and that's how I like it. So yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, brother. Uh, one cut of the dead, uh, easily a top three horror comedy for me all time. Oh, fuck it, easily. It, it, and, the, and like I said, it, to me, goes beyond a horror comedy. It's such a unique gem of a movie that, like, it's one of those movies where I'm like, it doesn't matter if you like, you don't like zombie movies. It doesn't matter if you don't like horror comedies. If yeah. you enjoy film and you enjoy the horror genre, mm-hmm. you are going to love this film. I've yet to hear anybody who doesn't like it even though i'm sure there's a a group of people (laughs) that don't like it but fuck them they don't know what they're talking about they also probably you know yeah don't like fucking itchy the killer so they can suck dick (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and if you're a filmmaker in any genre, whether it's horror or anything, I would recommend this film. This is a great film to watch if you're actually in the industry because it's so eye-opening. And it, it, there's probably a lot of inside jokes that people outside of the industry aren't always going to catch. I've actually worked on a couple of sets when I first moved out to California. I was a boom mic operator. And yeah, some of the some of the things, you know, some of the real subtle jokes in the film are only going to really be caught by people who've been in the industry. So, yeah, if you're a filmmaker in any way, shape or form, a strong recommend for One Cut of the Dead. All right. Two recommendations, one not seen. Jay, we move on to your third movie. My third movie is The Loved Ones. Uh, This one is streaming (laughs) on Prime. Is it? Did you pick the loved ones too? <laughs> it's literally my my third one as well. That's awesome. All right, so <laughs> dual 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 recommendation coming to you. I'm sure uh, Venom here will have way more to say about it than I do because I'm a man of few words. Um, but again, this is <laughs> you to you me do a friend. podcast and you're a man of few words. <laughs> well, I mean, I always have so much less to say compared to like you and pretty much everybody else that does this. Like all my stuff is just short and to the point. I don't I don't know how to elaborate and turn them into longer turn what I have to say into a longer review. That's fair. <laughs> so it's just kind of what it comes down to. Uh, either way, this is a, a a kidnap and torture movie. Um, it's got a really original reasoning and story to it. Um, some really great imagery and practical effects. Um, a very satisfying ending, and just all around great. Um, Good amount of tension, good amount of weird, fucked up shit that happens throughout the entire thing. Um, and yeah, I'm actually I'll just pass it off to Venom so I don't uh, take any more away from this, but uh, definitely recommend that. Yeah, oh, the loved ones. This this is uh, <laughs> this is another guilty pleasure movie for me. Um, I'm not going to necessarily say that I'm behind Lola and the things that she does in this movie, but Lola is. 
Uh, for for people who don't know me, I'm a very petty and vindictive person. It's a terrible thing to admit, but I really am very petty. Lola is one of the pettiest, most vindictive characters ever. And even though it's terrible to, to watch the things that she does to her one victim and then see the aftermath of what she's done to countless others before the film... I, Lola is legitimately psychotic. I mean, one of the most psychotic teenage female characters in, in cinema history. And and she's actually fairly adorable. Like, she starts out the movie kind of like an ugly duckling, like doesn't really do much with her hair or makeup. But then suddenly, come prom night, she's a whole nother person. She's somewhat cute. And, you know, when the evil comes out, so does the uh, attractiveness, apparently. I don't know. But yeah. I love this movie. It's it's so fun. It's a hard movie to watch. There's a couple of really intense torture scenes in the oh. film. Yeah, like really hard to watch torture scenes, but um still if you can, if you can get through it and especially that incredibly satisfying ending. I mean, if there <laughs> This this movie leaves no questions unanswered at the end. It it is such a just hard stop type of ending of just nope oh, yep it's over you know we we definitely got our ending let's move on you know there's no chance of a sequel with this one so yeah I I love the loved ones that's that's an absolute easy choice. Okay, I have not seen this, but I've heard about it. Um, in talks of being like. People always say, like a revenge movie. Mm, yeah, um, like... And I think, and, and they would never explain that, but to after hearing y'all explain the movie, I'm kind of like, okay, it has the feeling of the revenge movie, except it's the bad guy doing the revenge, not the good guy, so you're not exactly rooting for him, and they're getting revenge over like the pettiest shit, like, oh, they fucked up my Starbucks order. Got to remove their teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> so, that's that's one that uh, I've always wanted to watch, but I haven't got around to it. Now I really, really need to watch it. I've heard so much good shit about this. Um, Venom. What country is was this made in? That is an Australian film. Oh, uh, does she like fucking? kill a kangaroo for like fucking showing up on her back porch how dare you fucking be on my back porch thankfully no i don't think any animals die in this one it's just people yeah yeah she just hates people which is okay she hates boys i guess is the best way to put it <laughs> oh but i like boys that's why yeah, i make well. milkshakes daily um i would definitely have to check this one out though it sounds super fucking good um so that is two recommendations, and I have not watched Venom. Do you want to just wait until your number, till we do number twos? Or do you have a backup or anything? Oh yeah, brother! I always come prepared. I got a couple of backups just in case because I wasn't sure, you know, how popular some of my movies may have been. Like, like I'm, I'm trying to bring some of the best stuff that I've seen. Maybe not necessarily some of the most obscure. So yeah, I am prepared with yet another selection. Um, this movie is available on Pluto TV, which is um, kind of an obscure app, um, a lot like Tubi. It's a free streaming app. Uh, Pluto TV actually almost runs like um, like cable, like just kind of pay cable where you where it has 24 hour channels that are constantly running things. There'll be like a horror movie channel. There's actually a Mystery Science Theater 3000 channel and a Riff Tracks channel. Yep. So if any of you guys are fans of riffing, Pluto TV is a free app and you've got 24 hours of riffs constantly. So um, so yeah, Pluto TV available on all your you know consoles and streaming devices. But anyway, uh, the movie uh, that I now have for number three is a movie from Austria, which um, this is a movie that I remember getting uh, a lot of uh, feedback when it first came out. It came out in 2015 in this country. It may have come out the year before in its native Austria, but um, this is um, kind of one of those psychological horrors. This film is called Good Night, Mommy. And uh, what the basic premise of this movie is is uh, twin boys who are moving into a new house with their mother um, after she gets out of the hospital. Basically, mom has um, some major, major face-changing cosmetic surgery. And when mom comes back home from the hospital, her face is completely bandaged so that you can't see. All you can see is like her eyes and lips. 
for some reason, as the movie goes along and due to different things that the woman does, the boys start to believe that it's not their mother, that it's another woman who replaced their mother and is going to attempt to kill them. And, you know, as you're watching the film, you're listening to the boys' justification of their beliefs. And it's like, well, I can't really argue with that, you know, you know. Because we're talking about kids, obviously. And when I say kid, I mean literally, like, I think they're, like, maybe 14, 15-year-old twin boys. And like I said, um, mom comes home. They're not 100% convinced that it is their mother. They're convinced it's someone else. And they are willing to go to extreme lengths to find out. Uh, for the longest time, I thought this movie was French because it would definitely fit into kind of the French extremity movement of the early 2000s. But as it turns out, it actually is from Austria. Uh, as I mentioned, it is currently available on Pluto TV. If you're a fan of psych of more psychological horror, there is visceral horror in this film. Don't get me wrong. The third act does go, you know, pretty over the top. But there's also a lot of psychological um, elements to it. And, you know, a lot of social commentary about, you know, parents and children and trust issues and things like that. So it's definitely a thinker. If you're, you know, if you're a fan of movies like that, then I would strongly suggest Good Night Mommy from 2014, currently available on Pluto TV. Um, I, <laughs> should I even ask? Have uh, I any gentlemen seen I, this uh, I have not seen this movie, but I have seen music videos by The Weeknd. Which is pretty close. <laughs> You're actually not that far off. <laughs> Jay, have you seen this movie? How am I supposed to top that? I don't got a joke like that. I was going to say something along the lines of no, but that's exactly what I say to my dominatrix when she leaves for the night. But your joke was way better. Uh, no, I haven't seen Good Night, Mommy, but it is one that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah I remember one uh, with subtitles, so be prepared. I remember seeing the trailer for it, and it was like, this This looks pretty interesting, and then for some reason it never hit my radar again. Yeah. So, Oops. fair enough. Um, but I'm going to have to check it out. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. So, it wouldn't be me if I didn't come with a black and white movie. Ooh, nice. Yeah. And it wouldn't be me if I didn't bring a little bit of gothic horror into this. So once again, we're going back to Italy and talking about Mario Bava's classic Black Sunday. <laughs> yes. Um, a, vidful, a vidful witch and her fiendish servant return from the grave and begin a bloody campaign to possess the body of the witch's beautiful look-alike descendant, with only the girl's brother and a handsome doctor standing in her way. Um, when I first saw... one thing, First off, one thing you have to understand is... Horror was not allowed to be made in Italy during the ruling of the dictator Mussolini. And when horror was allowed to be made, if you look at almost all the early horror movies in Italy... From after World War II, you're going to see Mario Bava's name attached to him. Black Sunday is basically like his. Uh, are you okay, Cass? Did you make it up the chair, buddy? You, <laughs> Jesus Christ! My cat's asleep next to the keyboard. Fucking. Oh man, he pulled the blankets down and everything. Cass, I need you to get up. Damn it, Cass. Cause he'll claw, he claws every he, he'll put holes in fucking everything, man. He's a little behind the scenes of Kill the Cast. My cat sits in my chair above me, but so that he doesn't get holes in it, I have a blanket there, and his fat ass jumped up and pushed all the blankets aside. <laughs> um, okay, what I was saying is this is Mario Bava's. Basically, it's a hammer horror film. And even though it's in the 60s, it's still in black and white because they are still making horror movies very cheap in Italy. Especially because horror movies was such a new thing for Italy at this point in time. But this gothic horror and, and the look of the gothic horror is fucking perfect. The atmosphere is fucking perfect. And there's actually some pretty decent gore. The movie starts off with a witch getting a fucking uh, mask. 
hammered mm-hmm. into her face, and the mask has spikes inside of it. Mm-hmm. Like, it's very, very fucking good. It's one of those movies that, yeah, if you don't like black and white movies, or you don't like hammer horror movies because you don't like the old gothic horror aesthetic, or it's just too slow for you, um, I get it. But, Black Sunday is a piece of fucking history. We are talking about the man who basically would later invent the giallo subgenre um, and perfect it with blood and black lace. But his earlier film, Black Sunday, is just a gothic horror masterpiece, and I so highly recommend it. It is on Shudder. You really cannot go wrong with this. And once again, I'm assuming, Jay, you have not seen Black Sunday. That's just silly. Of course, no, I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I knew it was made before the 80s, so there was a good chance that, you listen, have not seen the it. The decade doesn't really have anything to do with it. It's just those aren't the ones that were around when I was, well, I guess that does make it the decade's fault. But well, no, you, like you I, said I, one time to me, and you, it, I think it was a joke at one point, but you were like, oh, if it's made, for, made before the 80s, I haven't seen it. That that's a more than accurate statement. Yes, more than likely, if it's made before the eighties, I haven't seen it. But it's not because I purposely avoid them. I don't like look up movies to watch and go, oh, oh, seventy nine. Nope, fuck out of here. It just, you know, being a person who rented movies in the early nineties, eighties horror is what was available. Oh, Jay, you should really check out this movie. What years it made in? Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't really matter, man. No, what year is it? You know how we rep? 1972 looking ass. Um, like, I watched Warriors because someone was like, oh, yeah, Warriors is great. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll go watch Warriors then. I mean, I know it's not horror, but I'm just saying. Like, I, I, the time period doesn't really stop me from watching a movie. It's just I haven't seen them because of when they were around. That's fair. Um, Venom, I, of course, assume <laughs> you've seen this movie. Probably how- owns 12 versions of it. Oh, no, yeah, you got me on that one as far as owning it. But, yeah, I mean, how can I forget a movie that opens with naked Barbara Steele? I mean, Ooh. that that leaves an impression, uh, that, especially on probably the 14 or 15-year-old boy I was when I watched it the first time. Yeah, and that mask, that little mini Iron Maiden mask, that is, I mean, for the for the time period, that is a very intense kill. That opening scene is just, it sets up the movie beautifully, but... Unfortunately, it's been so long. It's it's literally been over 20 years since I've seen it. So I remember very little much else about it other than I really did enjoy it. I mean, I don't think I've seen a Bob of a movie that I haven't enjoyed. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Black Sunday is a great little film with a great leading lady. <laughs> All right, there we go. Two recommendations and one not seen. We move it into Jay, who's going to tell us about a movie that was made after 1980. True that, and it's one that Kill the Cast has covered, actually. But um, after its initial release, it kind of faded from people talking about it. And I say that with my my sample group being the Facebook horror groups that I'm in. I consider those to be very casual or basic horror fans, and I don't mean that as an insult. I just mean that they're not watching as much movies as, say, us kind of people. Um, they usually rely on streaming, which is kind of why I, I went with the, the options I did. They rely on streaming or mainstream theatrical releases to get their horror, and they don't really venture into the indie scene. And so typically when an indie movie is out of the spotlight, it becomes obscure to those types of fans. Um, so I looked up to see where The Void was streaming these days. It's over Ooh. on Crackle, which is a free streaming service. Um, I fell in love with this movie right after the first time I watched it. Um, It's Lovecraftian. It's got some sci-fi in it. It's got some goddamn amazing practical effects. Like, even if the rest of the movie was terrible, which it's not, the practical effects alone would be worth watching it. It's got some major thing vibes going on in its creature design. Um, But basically, a group of people are stuck at a hospital. There's a cult outside the hospital trying to get in. Um, as well as some crazy monsters and shit going on inside. The ending leaves a little bit to be desired. It kind of goes off the rails towards the end there. Um, Mm. I thought they could have handled that a little bit better, but it is absolutely worth watching um, for just the effects alone. 
Uh, it's just, it it's like, I don't understand why more horror movies don't put that much effort <laughs> into their effects um, because the end result is fantastic. Okay, Venom. Have you seen The Void? As you hear me chuckling, I'm sure you know my answer. But I'm gonna. One thing I'm gonna say is, you guys already heard what Jay has to say about this movie. I think I like this movie five times more than Jay does. Uh, really? This was my number. This was my number one film of 2017, and the number two film wasn't even close. This movie speaks to me in so many ways. This movie is Lovecraftian because it is an adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness. A lot of that people I didn't did really, know. yeah, a lot of people didn't know that because they didn't make a big issue of it. Um, you kind of have to be a Lovecraft literature fan to really pick it out right away because obviously they changed a lot of it. But if you've read At the Mountains of Madness, other than the setting, because At the Mountains of Madness takes place in Antarctica, whereas this takes place in a hospital in, you know, who knows, Midwest America somewhere. Um, but yeah, the basic um, the path that the characters take is the same. Uh, the basic storyline is the same. The motivation of the villain is the same. So yeah, this is very directly a Lovecraft film. Um, as you said, the effects, um, Stephen Kostansky um, directed, wrote and directed this. He also did the effects. How often do we hear about that? Yeah, Writer, that's... director, special effects artist. I mean, that's pretty epic. His his DNA is all over this movie, and I'm not, and I don't mean that in the gross way, but. Yeah, I adore this film. I have three Void t-shirts. I have <laughs> I have a um an old one of the old 12-inch GI Joe figures. I actually have one of those with the the cult costume. I had a, a girl that I know who's a seamstress make me a little cult uh, costume and I have a, a 12 inch GI Joe wearing that costume. People think that it's like a manufactured figure when they see it in my house, but it's actually like a one of a kind thing that I actually love. I don't actually even display it that often, but anyway, I love this movie. I love everything about it, including the ending. The ending is a thinker. I'm, I'm definitely going to say that the ending is one of those that you're not going to get the first time, whether you even think that there is anything to quote unquote get but like I said, I'm a fan of the source material. I understand why these two characters end up where they are, even though they both had very different paths and di very different ends, yet they end up in the same place. But again, I don't really want to get into too much detail because this is a movie that really, really needs to be experienced. I know there's a lot of people that hate this film because they feel like it is a ripoff of things like The Thing or Hellraiser. It even ha has elements of The Keep in it. I don't know if anybody remembers that um, yeah. that Jewish horror film from the early 80s. It has elements of The Keep. Um, there, there, there's just a lot of great homages throughout the film, but th those homages didn't bother me. Not once did I think, oh, that that's a ripoff. That's very obviously Hellraiser or whatever, because I don't care. Because it, 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 it was done, you can tell that the people who made this movie absolutely love horror films. They, they, they die for it. And when you watch the special features, I, of course, I own this film, of course. And if you watch the special features, I mean, this was a two-year um, just a uh, mission of love for these guys. They would work 20 hour days. They would run out of money, have to put to product, uh, have to put the production on hold for like a few months, get the money together and then get back together. Um, the building that they shot in is actually an old uh, high school that was closed down. Uh, they weren't able to get permits to actually shoot in a hospital, which is the setting in the film. It's a hospital, but the building that they're in is an old, it's either a middle school or an old high school that got closed down. But uh, they were only able to film on weekends, which is part of the reason why it took so long to make this film. I mean, you know, Jay, you've seen the film, so you can see these effects. They're not easy effects to make. Um, the last effect at the end of the movie, the daughter, you know, once the, re the daughter exposes herself, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That effect took them four months alone to make. And oh, wow. they almost, that they almost, <laughs> yeah. And they almost scrapped it like three months in because the, they were just so upset. They really wanted that payoff. That was the, that, that was going to be the payoff monster for the movie. And, and it really is when you watch the movie. I mean, it's the biggest, gnarliest creature in the film. 
Um, and yeah, th they fought tooth and nail to make sure that they could get that in there. They did, you know, GoFundMes and Kickstarters and things like that. If I remember correctly, uh, the Kickstarter campaign actually paid for all the special effects. So uh, thank you to the general public for that because you guys helped make my favorite movie of 2017. Um, I, I love the performances. I love the writing. Uh, the score, the score is the underappreciated gem of this film. The score and the cinematography. The cinematography in this movie is so much better than a horror movie deserves. There's a shot at the very beginning of the film where someone is set on fire and the camera slowly pans out. It is one of the most gorgeous shots in horror of the last five years. It is a stunning shot. So again, I'm going to shut myself up because this is a movie I could talk about for hours and I have, and I probably will again. <laughs> I knew it was uh Lovecrafty inspired. I didn't know it was like a direct Lovecraft mm -hmm. story. I'm, they must've edited out the racism so that I didn't know. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know. They all are in a small town. So at least uh, one of them, by pure statistics, should be racist. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, they didn't, a cat didn't go by and someone was like, you know that cat's name? Um, <laughs> I love this movie. I think it's absolutely fucking amazing. Much like uh, Venom said, I think the homages are done well and respectfully. Um, it's clearly like a love of horror. I think there's a difference between a ripoff and homage. This can't be a ripoff of one thing if it's homaging 20 fucking things. Um, I also think the cult members outfits are like the coolest fucking cult member yeah, outfit ever. I also want to point out the lighting in this movie is like fucking Argento lighting. It's so fucking good. They do not overuse it, but when they they want that fucking Argento lighting, th they just pull it off mm, beautifully. Um, obviously, I love John Carpenter's thing, so I, I love the fucking monsters in it. The practical effects are so good. Um, but you know what? Jay is right on something. Those like mass horror Facebook groups, Jay's 100% right on those. You look at posts in those groups versus posts in a horror podcast group, and you get two different things. In the Facebook group, is people going, does anyone like uh, fucking The Conjuring? And it's like, yes, it's The Fucking Conjuring. But like in the horror podcast group, it's like, what does everyone think of Lucio Fulci's Manhattan Baby? I think it's a uh, nice uh, dystopian take on a personal <laughs> human level. And that scene where someone gets shit on in their eyeball is just, it's just a metaphor for Wait, how metaphor life thing? should be. Uh, Manhattan Baby is a movie, but it has nothing to do with the words I just said. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I watching, is this a sequel to Sallow? I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I, I do want to point out he is 100% right and him bringing up the void and saying the void needs more eyes on it, especially from those kind of people is 100% right. And I think I think we should be making more of a push for people who haven't seen the void to see it. And that's the problem is I'm not in a lot of those massive horror groups because I can't stand fucking posts that are constantly the same fucking i'm watching hellraiser tonight it's like listen bro, so is I, everybody i i mm -hmm. love hate relationship with these groups but if it was not for one of those groups we would not have met heather so <laughs> valid very valid i i just um personally it's fun. There's, a, there's a fun game i like to play whenever i see three or more people mention an older movie all of a sudden I'm like, probably just got added to streaming. So, and I'm almost always proven right. Today, I saw three different people in three different groups post about Slither. It's on HBO Max. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it was the other day. Everyone was posting about Pumpkinhead because it just got added to Shudder. Oh, and, yeah, I mean, there you go. I was happy because I was just see, like, oh, yeah, everyone another, watched I'm, Pumpkinhead. I'm derail us for a second because that's another thing that happens is 
is someone will ask, is Shudder worth it in these groups? And so many people will say no. Like, no, there's only like five good movies on there. And I'm like, it's because you guys are buying this service hoping it has every single Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Hellraiser because those are the mainstream movies you want to see. They're like, yeah, I can watch everything I need to in a week. And I'm like, no, you can't. There's so much good stuff, including their originals on here. You're just looking for very specific movies and you're not going to find them because that's not how rights to movies work. Oh, yeah. I bet if I pulled up my – since my list is all from Shudder and I was like, well, have you seen this, this, and this? They may, may have seen one of these movies, but I bet they haven't seen any of them because they don't want – Shudder is not for the average, average, everyday horror fan who mostly is like, oh, it's October. I got to watch horror movies. Like, nah. Shudder is – for the deeper cuts people who want to watch prom night 2 like that's who shutter is made for that's a good that's a good way to describe it that's perfect i would have gone with sleepaway camp 3 but yeah great example <laughs> well sleepaway camp 3 is not on shutter oh damn it but prom, prom night sleep. 2 is so say hello to mary lou um okay yeah we could go on forever about the void shutter uh, how it uh, despise uh, people in fucking Facebook horror groups, and that's why I'm only in podcast horror groups, because um, mm-hmm. we're just a better class of people. Not to <laughs> sound like that, but not to sound like I'm I'm a gatekeeping version of Lovecraft's cat, but still. <laughs> um, okay, Venom. What is your number two? All right, for my next one, I am now going to talk about the oldest movie on my list. And we're also going to the land of the rising sun. This is a oh. film that I oh. that I got to uh, review recently on No More Room in Hell. It was... Did it, Derek it was not a pick first... it? Um, did Derek... No, believe it or not, Mike picked it. Oh, shit. But there's a very specific reason why he picked it. I, I'll let you know here in a sec. But yeah. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you right now, uh, on, on two episodes of No More Room in Hell, two episodes ago, we did two films that potentially could have inspired Sam Raimi to make The Evil Dead. Uh, on a previous episode from, I believe, a year and a half ago, we did two movies that were potentially inspired by The Evil Dead. So we wanted to do the backwards um, uh, ratio of that one as well. So we went and we looked at obviously what the obvious pick is going to be 1970s Equinox. That's the movie that most people lean towards um, because of all the similarities that it has with the original Evil Dead as being an inspiration uh, to Sam Raimi. But this was one that Mike wasn't 100% sure um, in, inspired Raimi to do the evil dead, but there are elements in here, especially, you know, the, the secluded cabin element of it. And that is 1977's Hausu or house. Uh, I call it Hausu because there is an American horror film called house. I, <laughs> I just do it to separate the two. Cause if I say house and I'm talking to a hardcore genre fan, the inevitable question is going to be which one. So yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so for William Cat, it's House. For uh, for this one, it is House Sue, and uh, this is basically a haunted house movie. But it is the most over the top haunted house movie that you could think of. Obviously, it comes from Japan. Uh, there are animated sequences in here. There are killer pianos. There are uh, killer watermelon. There are um, wacky characters that man that turn into fruit for some reason i mean yeah this movie is a nutty nutty movie um uh, like i said basic haunted house movie um five or six uh friends all teenage girls go to visit one of the girl's aunts in a secluded country home uh when they get there the house is haunted but it's haunted in just like i said some of the most spectacular ways as opposed to actually there being spirits um, in the house, there are actual like elements of the house that are coming to life 
uh, all controlled by this girl's aunt, you know, unbeknownst to her. But yeah, so like I said, there are, you know, killer piano. The piano scene is probably the most classic because the girl basically gets dismembered. Yet after she's dismembered, she's laughing and giggling much like the Deadites in the Evil Dead uh, films. So, you know, that that's another reason that people kind of think this may have inspired Raimi because this this came what? Um, the Evil Dead was actually shot in 1979. It was shot two years before it was released in 1981. This film is from 1977. So a lot of people think that this does have direct influence on the Evil Dead. Obviously, you know, it's up to the mm. horror fans who watch I it. I think that there are some minor influences in there. I mean, I don't want to say that every single Haunted House movie inspired the Evil Dead because I, that would I, be an, an uh -huh. Well, uh, How likely is it, though, that Sam Raimi... In the late seventies, <laughs> saw a a Japanese horror film that had it just came out in theaters in seventy seven, and keep in mind back then it took a long time for those movies to come to a home video service, which you know by the late seventies you know VHS was was popping off a bit more and beta, but no one was releasing Halsu in America. You're right. You're absolutely right. But there's there's always art, there's always been art house theaters. I, That's I, true. I That's true. Toho, oh. who created Alsu, had art house theaters in California. I mean, I don't know where Raimi's from. I don't. I, I'm not the biggest fan of Sam Raimi, so I don't really know a whole hell of a lot about him. But. I, you know, I don't I, I don't necessarily think like I, I'm like I'm not pointing a finger. In other words, I'm not saying, oh, this movie absolutely inspired Raimi to do this or to do this. You know, like in one part in this movie, uh, a bust like an an like an antelope head starts laughing. That's on the wall. Very similar to what we see in the Evil Dead. So mm. it's just one of those things that when you see the similarity, you think to yourself, hmm. Even though what Jerry said is 100% valid, the likelihood of Raimi seeing this film less than two years after its release, um, you know, he probably would have had to have gotten like some kind of weird eight millimeter film strip or something of it to be able to see it back then. Unless, as we said, he saw it in an art house theater. So, but like I said, the theme of that particular episode was films that may have inspired Raimi to make The Evil Dead. Um, and, you know, like I said, we talked about House. Uh, Derek, obviously, is a huge fan of House. Anybody who knows Derek B. from Cinema Attack and Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space knows he is a huge Japanese horror film fan. And we had a blast talking about this one. Because, like I said, you can't watch this movie without a smile on your face. It is a horror comedy, but it's not like there's gags in it that are, like, side-splitting, you know, the funny, like, bent-over laughing. It's just the... the the kills and the scenarios that are going on are so over the top that you just can't help but chuckle. So like I said, if you're looking for a really weird late seventies haunted house movie, uh, you can't go wrong with Hausu from Japan. Uh, Jerry, I assume you've seen house. Oh yes. I love Hausu. It's one of those movies that you, you don't watch for the story. Yeah. You just watch for the visuals and just how fucking wacky it is. Um, it's, it's, fucking it's it's one of those movies that you just can't describe it you just have to watch it even bill Hader loves how i mean <laughs> i fucking love bill Hader. yeah when he yeah. went to the criterion archives like one of the movies he po he pulled out was how and was like i fucking love how and then he was wearing a he was actually wearing a how shirt That's nice. funny. um so yeah it's one of those movies that is just a uh, fantastic to watch and just enjoy, especially if you've never seen it before, or it's one of those movies where you're like, "Hey, you want to see some crazy shit?" and you put in Hausu. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Jay, have you seen Hausu? Another one I am aware of, but have not watched. That's 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 fair. It's one mm -hmm. where you could watch it, and since the story really does not matter, you don't have to read the subtitles. You're just there to see pretty <laughs> fucking pictures. Exactly. Well, and maybe girls I'll give that with a watch. The... Which streaming Girls service was that on? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention. That's actually on HBO Max. And I oh, didn't nice. mention um, HBO Max is a great source for Criterion films. Uh, they actually do have an exclusive streaming contract with Criterion, which is why HBO Max has all the Showa Godzilla films available to stream. So Not all of them. 
Oh, uh, exactly. And and they actually do have a really good horror uh, selection. Maybe not as great as some of the streaming services that have been out longer, but it's building up nicely. And I mean, they've got stuff like The Skin I Live In, um, Take Shelter, some really cool psychological horror from like the 2010s that are available. So, uh, but yeah, HBO is actually a great little source. I wouldn't necessarily get it specifically for horror uh, only like if you only watch horror films, maybe H because HBO Max, if you don't already subscribe to HBO, is a little pricey. It's fourteen ninety nine, which is you know the, almost what Netflix charges for their four K membership. So it's not cheap. Obviously, if you already subscribe to HBO uh, from through your home ca cable services, then HBO Max is free. Just download the app and log in with your credentials. But yeah, HBO Max actually has a surprisingly good uh, movie selection between, like like I said, classic kaiju, not just Godzilla, too. They got a lot of Gamera, War of the Gargantuans, just a lot of really cool stuff, and a lot of really obscure horror. Uh, currently, they have that Empty Man, which is a film that came out in 2020 that came out with no marketing whatsoever, and a lot of people are discovering that movie this year uh, on its home video release. Uh, that's also on HBO Max. So yeah, uh, HBO Max is actually a really good one. I wouldn't put it above Shutter and Netflix by any stretch of the imagination for horror. But if you already have an HBO subscription, yeah, grab HBO Max. It's a great little service. Plus they do have new shows too, stuff like that. So and I, I'm, uh -huh. HBO Max has a fucking amazing collection of classic black and white films. It's got the most dangerous game. It's got King Kong. It's got the Maltese Falcon. Like you've got, got all that, really all good heavy hitters in there. Yeah, it's it's also got a lot of really cool Japanese uh, black and white, like Kaiden and um, shit. What's the other one? Um, damn it, I can't think of it. But there's two like from the '60s, like horror anthologies from Japan. Oh, there. it's um fucking Obi. Um, ah, shit. Obi yeah, Trice, right. real name, no gimmick. <laughs> uh, it starts with an O. Yeah, you're right. It's on the tip of my tongue, too. <laughs> Onibaba. Onibaba, that's what it Onibaba. is. Onibaba, yeah. So Onibaba and Kwaiden are both on HBO Max, and I highly recommend them for period piece uh, Japanese horror. Those are both great films. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, back to Haosu. Highly recommend. Fun time. It's a, it's a great movie to watch with friends. Like I said, um, like Jerry was telling Jay, it's not necessarily a movie you got to pay attention to. Even if you've got like four or five American horror fans, uh, you know, getting together for a few beers, I would still recommend throwing this in there. Because even if you're not following the story, and like Jerry said, there's not really that much of a story. Um, but even if you're not following it, uh, the visuals are just so much fun. I, I feel like this would be a a great like riffing movie like you know get a, a bunch of drunk idiots together and just riff on this would probably be a blast but yeah highly recommend Hausu 1977 Jay get high and watch it you'll have a great time oh good plan um, I fucking really loved watching movies I okay that is I watched Mandy Stoned Ooh. I know you don't like it but man was it just a whole new experience <laughs> Fuck Mandy. Uh, that's so. That's <laughs> two recommendations and one I haven't seen. We move into our last three movies. My number one is Burnt Offerings from nineteen seventy six. Um, a family moves into a large old mansion in the countryside, which seems to have a mysterious and sinister power over its new residents. This is a classic slow burn tension building haunted house movie basically with with a good twist. It's it's Amityville horror before Amityville horror. Um while the events that supposedly took place in the Amityville horror happened before this movie the book for Burnt Offerings came out before the book for Amityville Horror, and this movie came out before the movie of Amityville Horror. And it's, like, characters and how they bounce off each other and how the tension builds and how the stress builds is just done so well that, like, by the end of the movie, you were screaming at certain characters 
and like understanding the anger of other characters and just completely fucking involved in these people's lives. It really draws you in and you just so fucking bad want to tell these characters what to do. Um, but not in a bad way. Not where you're like, you're so fucking stupid, do this. Because you understand why certain things can't happen. Um, I recently showed this to my girlfriend Chelsea for the first time. And because it was on Shutter, and I was like, we need to watch it. She's never seen it. And even she loved it. She was like, holy shit, the tension build up in this movie. It is, it is fucking flawless. And that's what I want in a did slow you just burn. Chef's kiss? Yes. You did? <laughs> I did. Because this, this fucking movie, fucking tasty morsel. Fucking nice little mutton shop for your fucking. <laughs> Uh, dinner. You're going to Ikea, you're going to go get some burnt offering Swedish meatballs, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, she loved this movie. It, it, it's, oh my god, it's so good. Uh, you really, really have to check this out if you want, like, a mid-70s horror movie. You really can't go wrong with this, especially if you like tension-building movies or you like haunted house movies. The the twist ending is so good. There's something else about the ending that I can't say, but when you watch it, you'll be like, now that's something I don't get in horror movies very often. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, oh, fuck me. I want to say it, but I can't. I can't say it, god don't damn it. it. I can't do it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just, an, this is how you do a slow burn movie. You build up atmosphere, you build up tension, and you give the proper payoff. That's what this movie does. And I'm not saying it's a slow burn where nothing happens until the end of the movie. No. Stuff happens through the movie. It builds tension. You get really wrapped up in these characters. Like, shit goes down. You, I can... I cannot... I cannot recommend this movie enough. It is so good. And in fact, I think it's underrated when it comes to 70 movies. I think it should be up there... At least on like the B tier level with like the Omen. That's all I'm saying. Uh, also, <laughs> Rob Zombie, I'm on to you. You you stole the song for Lords of Salem from this movie. <laughs> I know about it. I'm I'm just letting you fucking know. You thought, oh, well, no one will notice. It's not Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No one will notice me stealing this. I, I, I'm fucking on to you, sir. You stole the fucking intro song from Burnt Offerings. I know what you did. Anyway, uh, Jay, have you seen Burnt Offerings? No. You motherfucker, I told you to watch it like a what? month ago when we did talked you? about Pig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you son of a bitch. I haven't really been watching a ton of horror, though. I've just been, uh, I don't know. That's my, that's my focus elsewhere. That's fair. I've been rewatching Game of Thrones, so I haven't <laughs> fucking watched like anything except for Game of Thrones. <laughs> so I'm with you. Uh, Venom, have you seen Burnt Offerings? Uh, yes, uh, I actually got to review this on the Horror Cast a couple of years ago. We paired this with The Legend of Hill House. Uh, starring Roddy McDowell, and that was a great little uh, double feature there. But yeah, Burnt Offerings, man. I am not a big fan of Oliver Reed, but I really do like his performance here as the kind of clueless husband who's you know not really um, clear on what's happening, what legitimately is happening in this house. Um, but the shining light of this movie is Karen Black. Holy shit, her performance is stellar. It is... She hits every range, you know, scared, in, insane, uh, domineering. I mean, every element that a, that an actress can um, kind of spotlight she does in this film. Legitimately one of her best performances, if not her absolute best performance. Um, this is also written and directed by Dan Curtis, who is the man who brought us um, a lot of great made-for-TV anthology films. Of course, Trilogy of Terror was Dan Curtis. He also brought us Dead of Night a couple of years after Trilogy of Terror. And then a few years later, he did bring us Trilogy of Terror 2 to maybe lesser returns than the original, but still a solid, watchable film. I didn't know he did Dead of Night. 
Yeah, he did the uh, the Dead of Night remake, the one from the 70s, yeah. Holy mm-hmm. shit. I also want to say this. I think uh, this movie uh, heavily inspired, or I wouldn't be surprised if this movie heavily inspired Kubrick when he made The Shining. Mm. Uh, I, I, I'd buy that, absolutely. Well, all right. Uh <laughs> So yeah, go fucking watch Burnt Offerings. It's in, it's on fucking Shutter, and it's fucking amazing. Uh, mm. Jay, what is your last movie? My last movie, and remember when I said at the beginning these are in no particular order because I actually there are, there are other movies on my list I like more than this one, but it's still one that I feel flies under the radar. Um, this one's on Netflix, so I kind of tried to cover a good amount of streaming services so that nobody was left out of the ability to watch at least a single suggestion. Um, this one is a Netflix original. Uh, it is called Apostle. It stars mm. Dan Stevens, who I absolutely love. And if anybody's ever seen The Guest, which is also a lesser known indie thriller, um, then you know who Dan Stevens is. Uh, I, I love him. Almost everything I've seen him in, he's been fantastic in. So I love watching him act. Um, this one is a folk horror um uh what is the decade it takes place in it's it's old uh, old time it's like times. the first decade of the 1900s it's like yeah early yeah, so early 1900s goes to this town to find his uh his his sister who he believes has been kidnapped or whatever and finds fucked up townsfolk people and it gets crazier and crazier as the movie goes on um it's directed by uh Oh man, I can't remember his name is Garth or Gareth, the the director Gareth. of the raid, Gareth Evans, um, uh-huh. and it's it's really good. Um, the the action I use that in in a quote unquote section. I just like you know when when things are happening um, that aren't conversation is what I mean. Is is really well done. The effects are really well done. Um, when people die, it's really good looking. Um, it's got enough mix of real world and supernatural stuff going on. Um, I think the story is really good. I really enjoyed it a lot, and I don't really hear anybody talk about it ever, even when it first hit Netflix. I think it, it flew under the radar, came out one October, I think, um, <laughs> and then just nobody ever talked about it ever again. But it's definitely uh, one that I recommend. Now, if I remember correctly, if, you, know, you probably remember this. When this came out, the horror podcasting world was in a huge argument about it with some people claiming it wasn't horror with some people claiming it was one of the best horror movies hmm. of the year. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, yeah, we actually did review this on fresh cuts, uh, the week it came out. Uh, we were all big fans of it. Uh, in fact, my, cause I usually do a list of favorite films and favorite kills of the year. I might not talk about them on every show, but it just, it's just something that I do for myself. And, yeah, there's a kill in this movie that's like a top three kill from 2018. Um, all I got to say is screw head. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Anybody who's seen the movie knows what I'm talking about. One of the most vicious, painful kills I've ever seen, uh, at least in a modern horror film. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, Jay's right. I mean, I remember a couple of different shows talking about it when it first came out. I remember... I think Dave Parker may have had it in his top 10 for 2018. If I remember correctly, I think at least one person from 22 shots also had it in their top 10. So some people did recognize it. I, it was an honorable mention for me because it was kind of an end of the year watch. I mean, it came out in like mid October. So that's kind of close to the end of the year for me, because usually I, I reserve December for rewatches. I, I, for the most part, it's got to be a huge horror release in December for me to want to watch it. But yeah, um, so it wasn't necessarily in my top 10, but definitely an honorable mention. But yeah, I mean, this kind of cult religious horror um, definitely works for me. Um, this one, again, kind of a slow burn. But once it gets going, it absolutely gets going. Just great dialogue, great characters, a very hateable group of villains. I mean, yeah, this movie has a lot of great aspects to it. Um, it might be a little slow for some, it might be a little talky, a little preachy for others. Um, but overall, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Definitely a recommend. Yeah. It's a little, uh, heavy handed, but I do really like the battle of the, of this man versus this religious cult. 
I, I do really enjoy that for this movie, but it, it, it is kind of slow. It is very dialogue based, which is fine. But sometimes I'm just like, y'all are just repeating shit. Come on now. We know. <laughs> um, they could have trimmed some stuff in this movie, trimmed a little bit of the fat. But I do really like that movie. So I, I guess three recommendations all around there. Uh, yeah. Venom hit us with the last movie of the night. All right. The last movie is actually a film from 2010 that I only watched for the first time just a month ago. And this was a film, uh, once again, for the podcast Under the Stairs summer series. Uh, this is a film that just completely went under my radar. It's a film that I knew existed, but since I didn't hear a lot about it when it first came out, I remember seeing it like on the shelves at like, um, you know, uh, fries and places like that that had a lot of um, physical media selection. I remember seeing it when it came out. The cover looked mildly interesting with a girl, well, you know, basically an Asian girl covered in blood on it. I, this might actually be one of Jerry's selections into uh, the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm not sure. So if it is, I thank you, Jerry, for making me watch this because it turned into one of my favorite movies of that year. And the film I'm talking about is from South Korea, and it is called Bedeviled. No, basically. someone beat me to it. I was going to pick oh. it and someone someone picked me to it. When I saw it on the list, I'm like, Jerry had to pick that. It, it's such a Jerry movie. But yeah, um, like I said, this is a movie that completely flew under my radar. But watching it, uh, by the way, it is available on Tubi. So absolutely free. You will be dealing with subtitles and, of course, commercial breaks on Tubi, just to make sure everybody's clear. Tubi and Pluto TV are two of the streaming services where you will have to deal with commercials. So if that's something that bothers you, just be aware but anyway, yeah, The Devil 2010 available on Tubi. Basically the story of a young woman who's basically mentally, physically, sexually, and emotionally abused by both her husband and other members of the community, including, you know, being sexually assaulted by her own husband's brother. Um you know, the, the woman is basically just beat down, like I said, mentally, physically, and then eventually something happens to her child, which pretty much sets her off. And she just goes on an absolutely insane killing spree. And this is, like I said, this is a petite little Korean girl, and she is able to do some gnarly things to these people in the village. Uh, the village has nine people in it. Um, and then the character that we follow, I, one of the complaints I've heard of this film is that the character that we actually follow, it's kind of hard to say, is she an antagonist or a protagonist? Because um, the person that we follow throughout the majority of the film isn't the woman in question that's being physically and mentally tortured. It's someone else. But we follow her, you know, the movie starts in Seoul, Korea, and then she travels to the village of her grandfather to take care of some uh, to take care of his house after his death from 15 years ago. And she just kind of gets caught up in the drama of this village involving this woman and, you know, all the uh, different terrible things that she's had to go through. This is another one of those guilty pleasure movies. This is like a rape revenge film, but without the rape. Um, just, you know, this woman is just very, very abused. Like I said, I mean, I can't, I can't really, I don't, I don't want to say specifics uh, any more than I've already said, because this is definitely a great movie to experience. You feel this woman's pain and frustration. And as I've already said at the beginning of this, uh, uh episode i am a very petty vindictive person myself so when i watch a movie like this i have an ear-to-ear -ear grin you know for the second half anyway once once our uh antagonist just kind of goes crazy and does what she does uh, i adore this film i love everything about it like i said it's very hard to watch for the first half hour or so because like i said you got to you got to deal, you know, obviously if it's a revenge film, then there has to be something that this woman's getting revenge for. And, you know, it's not always the easiest thing to watch. I'm going to say something right now that may be kind of unpopular in the horror genre, but despite me being a 50 year old, 40 plus year horror watcher, I do not enjoy watching women get victimized in horror movies. And I'm coming from the eighties where basically slasher films in the 80s make a living, made a living victimizing women. 
So you do have to deal with a little bit of that at the beginning of this film. But like I said, once she snaps, it just turns into guilty pleasure, shameful joy as I'm watching this woman act absolutely decimate the members of her village. Um, and then we come down to what actually turns out to be a very satisfying ending. Um, you know, whether you agree with the character arc of our main character, you know, not the woman who's being abused, but our main, the person that we're following, uh, depending on how you feel about her as a person might skew the way you look at this film because she's not the nicest person. She's actually a little bit of a cunt, unfortunately. Um, she does have somewhat of a redemption moment at the end, but the question is, is it enough of a redemption considering everything that the woman, both the things that she's done and the things that she's allowed to happen? Uh, you know, some people kind of feel like maybe she should have deserved a little bit more of the repercussions of what happened in the village. But, you know, I'll let you guys watch it and make your own decision. But ultimately, this is a very visceral movie. You've got some great kills, a lot of blood. But like I said, you got to deal with a, you know, petite little pretty Korean girl being victimized by all the members of her village, including, well, there's only one child in the village, thankfully, and it's her child. So, you know, it's not like there's little kids throwing rocks at her or anything. But yeah, this is definitely an emotional experience, this film. Uh, this was one of those movies that when it was over, I just kind of sat quietly in my living room and kind of reflected on what I just watched because it is a very powerful film with a very powerful message. You can only push people so far before they push back. And uh, for that, this film is easily one of the best films. For, in my money, it is a top three film of 2010 and potentially a top 10 for the whole decade. It is just a wonderful film, great experience. It, it might leave you breathless by the time it's done. And like I said, you might feel a certain way about the main character that could skew your opinion of the film. But otherwise, it gets a high recommend from me. That is Bedeviled, currently available on Tubi. Jay, have you seen it? I have not. I never, this is one I uh, used to, I, uh, my brain... I've been able to say I've heard of all of them so far, but this one I've not even heard of. So it sounds... Uh, it sounds like I might be into it. Yeah, this movie is... It's brutal pretty much throughout the entire movie. Uh, when it comes to revenge flicks, you ain't fucking with South Korea. South Korea has made some of the best revenge flicks I have ever seen. Um, and South Korea does horror a bit differently they don't really care to do like monsters but they they care to do movies that are more about what happens when a human is pushed too far and you see this in and they really like to make make them drama based um uh, and very much about what these characters are going through and you see it in you know, a, a tale of two sisters, um, old boy, I saw the devil, um, even a movie that does have a big monster, the host, it's very much about the human emotion and what happens when the human is pushed to a certain point. And, and South Korea does that better than, than anyone, especially when it's a revenge movie. Cause the host is a revenge movie. Don't let anyone fool you. <laughs> Th that lazy ass dad was getting revenge on that monster. Um, but the point is, is, is this is a movie that is, uh, less exploitation than like, I spit on your grave, mm -hmm. but it is kind of like the, the South Korea version of it in a, in, in a sense of like the, the revenge she takes is fucking epic and glorious. <laughs> um, and the inclusion of the, the main character and her throughout the movie puts this nice little, like, unique twist on everything and gives you a little bit more to think about. So, uh, I, 
Venom is 100% right on this movie. Um, in the summer series, yes, I would have picked it had it not been picked by someone else um, who was like, bam. And I was like, all right, I think I picked a different Asian movie, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah, there was a few on the list, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Two recommendations, one not seen, which has been our most commonly used thing, which is perfect because, you know, that gives us, you know, kind of a, a nice counterbalance. So, there you go, everyone. 15 movies that you can not run out and see, but sit on your fucking couch and see. And enjoy. There, there's a plethora of, of movie choices here. No matter what kind of movie you want to see. <clears throat> so, check them out. Thank you for, for joining us before we get out of here. Let's let Venom pimp himself. Venom, where can people catch you? All right. Uh, the main place you can find me is No More Room in Hell, available on the Dark Discussions Podcast Network. On our uh, latest episode, I believe our latest episode actually is the episode I talked about earlier, two movies that uh, may have inspired Sam Raimi to make The Evil Dead. Like I said, Equinox and Haosu are reviewed. Uh, we also have other segments, you know, before the feature reviews to listen to and enjoy if you like. Uh, that is, um, we do that once or twice a month. We're not really on a set schedule, but whenever we can get together, we do. Now, uh, the sister podcast to No More Room in Hell is Fresh Cuts. That is a weekly podcast that comes out um, like clockwork every single week where we review the newest horror release in the genre. Uh, our last episode looked at a Shutter release, Teddy, which is a French werewolf film um, that most of us enjoyed. So uh, check that out if you get a chance. And on the next episode, we will be, we'll be looking at Don't Breathe 2, which, of course, released this weekend. I actually just saw it today before we recorded here. So tune in to uh, check out our thoughts on Don't Breathe 2. You can also hear me on It's Not Horror OK, kind of our little comedy movie commentary podcast where, as the title implies, we're not doing horror, but we do a lot of action and comedy and some horror adjacent type films, but definitely no horror. Um, on our re most recent episode, we looked at Christopher Guest's classic mockumentary Best in Show uh, from 2000, um, which was probably one of the most fun I've ever had on a movie commentary that is also available on the Dark Discussions podcast network. Um, and then, unfortunately, most of my other shows on are on extended hiatus. Uh, Jerry earlier mentioned Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space will be making its return sooner than later. So look out for that on Legion Podcasts. Um, in the Mic of Madness has been on hiatus as Rebecca Reinhardt, the main host of that show, has been handling a lot of her independent film projects. She's now currently working on her third film in a row, which has kind of kept her away from um, In the Mic of Madness. And at the same time, she actually started a new podcast, um, a female-centric podcast called uh, The Slumber Party Massacre Podcast with um, Lacey Liu, Heather Powell, um who else is on there carly, carly. For, yep carly from 22 shots fame and his and hers are on there so um so she's been on that show a little bit more uh she, we did talk recently in the mic of madness will be back before the end of the year she'll have some time after her latest film project where she is directing and editing so she is a busy lady uh, check out her films if you get a chance. Uh, they are mostly straight to video, and at the very least, they're always entertaining. So check that out. Um, what other shows do I have? Theme Warriors is a show that was on a hiatus, came back to do one episode this past April, and then once again, because of circumstances, we have not been able to get together since April. Uh, but we do have plans to get together in September to do another show. For those who don't know, the Theme Warriors podcast is is not a specific genre podcast. Basically, it's all encompassing cinema. And what we do is we pick a theme and each host picks one film relating to that theme. Uh, the theme for our next episode, whenever that gets recorded, will be real life fathers and children in 
in films, uh, stuff like uh, Ryan O'Neill and Tatum O'Neill and Paper Moon. So any real life, uh, you know, father and child combinations in film, you're going to hear stuff like that. So that'll be the next episode of Theme Warriors. Um, I did a guest spot on, what was my last guest spot? Uh, this one. <laughs> well, yeah. oh, wait, I'm sorry, Cinema Attack. I did a guest spot on Cinema Attack where we actually looked at two Bruno Mattai cannibal movies. Anybody who knows anything about Bruno Mattai knows that his films are always an experience, especially his later ones, because um, he does have some classic stuff in the 70s, like Rats, Nights of Terror. But then, you know, he kind of started doing more parody type horror films in like the late nineties and early two thousands up until his death in 2007. But on that episode of cinema attack, we look at uh, Mondo Cannibal and in the land of the cannibals, both very quote unquote, interesting horror films. Uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, check out that latest episode of cinema attack. And that's it for me, gentlemen. But is it Matai or Matei? That's always the question. Yeah, I, I, what do I say? I say Matai, I believe. I say Matai heard, also. Yeah, I've heard Matai just as equally. So honestly, I don't know. I'd have to hear it from the man himself. I always, I always wanted, I always want to know. Someone get in a Ouija board. Let's dig up his Gaspar, grave. Gaspar, Gaspar Noe is another one. Is it No or Noe? It's, I've heard, it's, I've heard equally both. Gaspar, no, I'm not watching his movies. <laughs> um. All right, everyone, that's it for us. We are going to get out of here. Uh, Jay and I really don't have anything to pimp because we haven't been recording podcast. Uh, well, no, Jay, you did a guest spot on um, Heather and Scott's gaming show, right? No, I am doing one on the gaming show when we talk about gaming movie adaptations because I've watched almost all of them, at least all the ones that we got over here. There's some Japanese ones that I haven't seen. Um, but I did um, their regular show. We did uh, another top five list. And I can't remember what it was. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, huge shout out to Heather and Scott, Friday oh, Nightmares uh, podcast. Movies. Top five disturbing movies. That was the episode. I oh, was okay. Disturbing movies. Fair. Uh, shout out to them for keeping the Kill the Cast feed alive while we've been gone. We appreciate it. Their show is fucking awesome. Definitely go check that out. Um, I did a guest spot on Married with Children podcast, but I don't know when that's coming out. Um, sometime in August, I've got a guest spot, uh, coming out for a show that when it drops, I will share it to everyone. It was really, really fucking good. Um, but you'll have to wait and see. Other than that, I've got nothing. I'm gonna, I'll be back podcasting, uh, the next, under, next Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. We're doing Godzilla vs. Destroyer, right? Yes, sir. Yep, so that will be fucking epic. Uh, the 1995 ending of Godzilla. Mm -hmm. uh, ending the Heisei era. Uh, and then we'll also be doing Ultraman. Woohoo, I love Ultraman. Oh, yeah. Um, so that's it from us. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being patient as I got all my shit together. And welcome us back with open arms. We love you all. Thank you to Venom for jumping in to uh guess with us while kenneth is out um, yeah definitely thank you for having me guys yeah that's that's all we got y'all have a good fucking night day month whenever you're listening to this enjoy horror get shutter watch some streaming shit and we will see y'all next time on kill the cast podcast <laughs> take care hail satan If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. 
horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.